what kind of person one might have met if one had had the good or bad fortune to meet Beethoven. It might have been pretty scary. What was it uh, somebody said when Rossini met Beethoven, the butterfly met the lion. And I think one might have felt a bit like a butterfly in Beethoven's presence. The caricature of Beethoven, wild, hair everywhere, um, it implies a lack of control and a lack of serious, organized thought. And that is the antithesis of Beethoven. He was absolutely all about serious, organized thought. No lack of control at all. Yes, he is, if you like, full of apparently uncontrolled temperament and anger, but there is also the opposite, the immensely sensitive and kind and generous, warm-hearted and also deeply vulnerable man, which will never appear in a caricature. He's the whole range. Fundamentally, it is positive. He's not misanthropic or malevolent. He's wanting always to communicate beauty and warmth and love and hope. September 20th, 1807. Dear beloved and only Josephine, may heaven grant me one undisturbed hour to spend with you. I do not care to put up with the refusals of your servant any longer. Is it really a fact that you do not want to see me anymore? If so, do be frank. Beethoven spent the year 1808 hard at work preparing for an epic concert. A four-hour extravaganza, all Beethoven. If there is one snowing night in Vienna where I could go to a concert, this would be absolutely this famous concert. When Beethoven wanted absolutely to show to Vienna how great he was. I think that he saw this as an opportunity at the age of 38 to finally make his mark on Viennese musical life and perhaps even finally to overcome what he must have seen as his primary competitors in the music field, which was surprisingly Haydn and Mozart. But if you read contemporary music journalism, um, there's constant talk of our three great composers, our three great German composers, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, all in the present tense, as if the fact that Haydn was too old and feeble to compose didn't count anymore, or the fact that Mozart was dead didn't count anymore. And I think Beethoven had this chip on his shoulder. I think he'd always had a chip on his shoulder, especially with respect to Mozart. Um, and that he saw then the concert of, of 1808 as an opportunity to... Mm, defeat his rivals. The theater was full, a maelstrom of noise as the audience hurried in from the snow. Beethoven deliberately started with his quietest opening movement yet.
you have a piece like the Pastoral Symphony, which, you know, in its own serious way, exploits these mimetic gestures that are supposed to evoke nature. So you have, you know, the opening movement, the pastoral movement. You have a slow movement, the scene by the brook. You have a storm. It's really a tremendous amount of variety. Beethoven is saying, I'm more serious, I'm better. In every respect, it's calculated to be an overwhelming event. After the Sixth Symphony, Beethoven sat at the piano and performed a new concerto. Here, for the very first time in the keyboard literature, we have a piece in which the piano actually begins the entire piece. The thematic material is stated by the piano at the beginning, and you have this amazing... The first theme, which is presented by the piano alone. I mean, nothing this remarkable, nothing with this sense of um, revolution and volatility has ever been heard by a Viennese audience in the beginning of the 19th century, let alone the 18th century. Um, that the piano can present such a, a strangely amorphous theme and then be answered by the orchestra in B major is, is absolutely, I, I, I mean, the, the degree to which that is shocking is just immeasurable by our 21st century standards. I mean, if I play a cadence, which ends on the dominant of G major, and then the orchestra answers me in B major. This kind of harmonic palette, uh, tonal palette, use of keys, uh, modulations, completely unheard of, even by Beethoven standards, I think. I don't think that Beethoven wanted to show the world that he was a better composer. I think he, what he did want to show the world was that there were a lot of these charlatan or charlatan composers who were making a huge living and had enormous success with, with writing absolute uh, terrible music. And Beethoven couldn't stand that. And that would, I think that was something where he wanted to prove the world that he was on a much higher level and a far better composer, better pianist. <laughs>
there is a lot of wildness, there is a lot of almost aggression, there is a lot of abundance. So I wouldn't be surprised if you look at his father. They, they sometimes say that his father was a, used to drink too much and was quite, quite wild and, and aggressive, could be quite nasty. I'm sure there's, there must have been something true of it. In, it's, it probably ended up in Beethoven as well. I mean, it, it runs in the family. <laughs> and I think Beethoven probably had more of his father inside him than, than he would have liked. But that's probably what gave his music such enormous strength and, and power. It, it's, I don't think to, to be a good composer, you shouldn't be completely normal. What is amazing about the works of Beethoven is how much he's always constantly sort of, you know, digging at the material and in the material to to reach to reach deeper. And I feel often for Beethoven deeper means at the end of the day higher. The fourth concerto is one of those heartbreaking pieces in the sense that we know that it's the last concerto that Beethoven played in public. The effect that that um, disappointment had on Beethoven's career, his confidence, his ideas of, of his self-worth, I think must have been massive. Um, the idea of Beethoven the pianist suddenly became questionable, became um, fraught with, with problems because of his deafness and his frustration with the keyboards. Um, his frustration at being able to play the keyboards. So the fourth concerto is sort of that last glimpse of Beethoven's brilliance and virtuosity and, and um, revolutionary character as a pianist and composer. The fourth concerto was considered immensely difficult by contemporary standards at the beginning of the 19th century. It was one of those pieces I think that was absolutely tailor-made for Beethoven's pianistic abilities. To put oneself in the shoes of a person like that who was really at the forefront of, of Viennese musical life as a virtuoso keyboard player, to suddenly be faced with the sort of end of an entire chapter in his life as, as a keyboard virtuoso must have been a major, major blow. No one guessed he would never perform a piano concerto in public again. After an intermission, the audience heard what would become the most famous notes of all time. The opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is like to give an uppercut to the people, to, to, to the audience. It's just to do, do, <laughs> ta, 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 ta. Beethoven would you'd start, you know, da, 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 and then, da, 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 da. We can invert that, and da, 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 we can re repeat it. Mozart could write a symphony in four days. Beethoven could do that too. He could write very, very fast. But sometimes he wanted to work and work and make something grander. And he was thinking more of the future. You know, Mozart was writing for Saturday. 
And Beethoven was beginning to write for eternity, you know. That was one of the, the conversations he had with his creator, you know. He wanted, he wanted to be, as it were, a great composer, I think. <laughs> I mean, if we look at the Fifth Symphony here, when he's worked himself up into a frenzy, he's writing a fortissimo passage, and you can get notes flying all over the page, and you see tremendous displays of temperament, and also in the crossings out, and great swishes of pen all over the place. So the composing process in Beethoven is more, more similar to the work in progress of a sculpture, like Michelangelo. So you already have a complex idea of what the statue will be but you have to work a lot to take all the extra marble, all the extra element, just to, to live the, the pure uh, artistic product. In the Fifth Symphony, when you get to the end of the scherzo and everything seems to be fizzling out, and then it builds up instead, builds up, and you think, what is going to happen now? You have been sitting there for nearly half an hour, and it all builds up, and quite suddenly everything thunders in. <laughs> Beethoven had thrown all the dice, but four hours of unfamiliar music in a freezing cold theatre was too much for his audience. It was not a success in the sense that people probably wanted to go home. But I think it was a success in that the very fact that Beethoven could pull it off, kind of doing it is more important than having it be a success. And, and it is, as I say. Uh, simply so monumental that you've got to admire the man for, uh, you know, undertaking it. One admirer, Napoleon's youngest brother, Jerome, offered Beethoven a permanent post in the German town of Kassel. Beethoven accepted the offer to the shock of Vienna's nobles. Three of them, Prince Lopkowitz, a patron of the arts, Prince Kinski, also a great patron, and the Archduke Rudolf, brother of the Emperor and a pupil of Beethoven's, changed his mind by offering him a healthy salary, just to stay in Vienna. His music is so firmly rooted in everything human, you know, with all of its frailties and weaknesses and shortcomings of all sorts. But at the same time, it's, um, there's a, an element of Promethean struggle and of uh, attempt to always reach higher and to never give up and never surrender. Something that always tries to elevate itself from the difficulties or the misery inherent to, to the human condition.
that's also what's so fascinating to me is that he's perceived often as a sort of misanthropic character, but he's, he's, his music is also the music of an inveterate optimist, of someone who never gives up in, in thinking that, you know, men can be better. Events made it hard to be an optimist. The French were back, and unlike last time, Vienna opted to defend itself. But a short siege brought the city to its knees, followed by months of occupation. During the bombardment of Vienna, Beethoven is said to have hidden in his brother's cellar and covered his ears with a pillow to protect his weak hearing. It was a terrible time for him. He said that there's, there's uh, lots of cannons and gunfire and um, shortages of everything and, and can't buy things, can't buy boots. The whole life is completely disrupted by the French. What a destructive, disorderly life I see and hear around me. Nothing but drums, cannons and human misery in every form. I had begun to have a little singing party at my rooms every week, but the accursed war has put a stop to everything. All the nobility left Vienna for uh, the countryside where they were out of harm's way. In particular, his close friend Archduke Rudolf left in May 1809. And Beethoven wrote a very heartfelt personal piano piece for Archduke Rudolf just before his departure. Labour vol, farewell. The invasion of the French must have been a mighty blow. Beethoven had profoundly felt and held ideas about equality, brotherhood, the way a, a society, a free society, um, should work, and that he uh, encouraged you know, people to think that way through his music. Vienna, January the 2nd, 1810. Hardly had I recovered when my illness sent me back to bed. Is it any wonder? We no longer have even decent bread to eat. Vienna, February the 4th, 1810. We are being supplied with bad food for which we have to pay incredibly high prices. Vienna, May, 1810. I should be happy if that fiend had not settled in my ears. If I had not read that a man should not voluntarily quit this life so long as he can still perform a good deed, I would have left this earth long ago by my own hand. One moment contemplating suicide, the next asking his assistant to help him smarten up with a new shirt and neckties. Beethoven, approaching 40, was hoping to woo another teenager to be his bride, Therese Malfatti. It seems he even wrote her a small piano piece, later mistakenly called For Elise. It's funny to see how famous and well-known a small piano piece like Furie Lisa has become over the years. It's certainly not Beethoven's best piano work, but I think it's probably one of the few works which actually does what it was 
supposed to do, I mean, it wasn't supposed to be played in concert, it was supposed to be played by people at home and enjoyed by people who play it. This is typically a piece which is much, much more fun to play than to listen to. So if you've heard it two or three times, I mean, it, it starts getting a little bit irritating. Dear friend, every day there are fresh inquiries from foreigners, new acquaintances, new circumstances. But my master, Archduke Rudolf, makes the same demand and wants me to be with him. Your Imperial Highness, I see that you want to have the effects of my music tried on horses as well. For that favor, I shall remain as long as I live your most willing servant. And the music will be brought to you at the fastest gallop. There's a famous occasion in 1812 when he briefly met Goethe, the great German writer, one of the towering cultural figures of early German Romanticism. And they are going for a walk at the Teplitz, the spa, and the imperial party comes along. And Goethe, as a properly brought up Enlightenment 18th century man, stands aside and lets the party pass and takes off his hat. Beethoven stri strides straight through the middle as if indifferent to this. Beethoven had this sort of pride. In Teplitz, Beethoven also wrote, but never sent, letters to yet another love of his life. Not a teenager this time, but evidence would suggest a married mother called Antony Brentano. Beethoven was you know, intensely human in the sense that he may have said that you know, uh, he disapproves of uh, an extramarital affair uh, or anyone who would engage or try to, to you know, foster one, and yet he himself did because he fell in love. Teplitz, July the 6th, 1812. My angel, my all. Only a few words today. Be cheerful. And be forever my faithful, my only sweetheart, my all as I am yours. However much you love me, my love for you is even greater. July the 7th, 1812. Even when I am in bed, my thoughts rush to you. My immortal beloved, now and then joyfully, then again sadly, waiting to know whether fate will hear our prayer. No other woman can ever possess my heart. Never, never. Oh, God, why must one be separated from her who is so dear? Your love has made me both the happiest and the unhappiest of mortals. Beethoven's cash ran as short as his luck. War had crushed the Austrian currency and his salary plummeted. But good luck followed bad. In 1813, the British General Wellington defeated the French in Spain. Beethoven accepted a lucrative commission to write a patriotic symphony. France was finally over, and a congress convened in Vienna to divide the spoils. The victors held endless balls and turned to Vienna's greatest composer to entertain them with two new symphonies, his seventh and eighth.
While Europe rejoiced, Beethoven despaired. His hearing had all but gone. On the 25th of January, 1815, at a concert for the Empress of Russia, he sat at the piano to accompany a singer in one of his early compositions. It was his last known public appearance as a pianist. Beethoven's relationship with his younger brothers, both of whom had moved to Vienna, had never been easy. Then, in November 1815, his brother Caspar Karl died. Beethoven, who had always looked down on his brother's wife, sought custody of his nephew Karl. For four years, they fought bitterly over the young child. Vienna, February the 6th, 1816. I have fought a battle for the purpose of wrestling a poor, unhappy child from the clutches of his unworthy mother. Last night, that queen of the night was at the artist's ball until 3 a.m., exposing not only her mental, but also her bodily nakedness. It was whispered that she was willing to hire herself for 20 gulden. I have to support my little nephew entirely. Until now, he has been at a boarding school. That costs up to 1,100 gulden. I have had bad luck again with another servant. He gets drunk, stays out of the house for nights on end and is shockingly rude. My hearing has become worse. I have never been able to look after myself and my needs. I am even less able to do so now. In the late 18-teens, Beethoven was somewhat more erratic in his behavior. He was uh, uh, less conscientious about his hygiene. He was uh, uh, less controlled, let's say, when dealing with other people, uh, uh, you know, more likely to ignore um, etiquette um, and proper social behavior. Um, he didn't compose as much. Um, and I suspect that there were a number of reasons for this. Uh, one would have been his increasing deafness, another would have been his increasingly bad health, and a third would have been his increasingly difficult family situation, especially with respect to his nephew, Carl. These were terrible years, but not entirely without composition. It's one of the sonatas that is perhaps the least known and the least liked. It's quite a demanding piece, also for the listener, in fact. You know, they have to really, they can't expect to just sit there passively and, and for something to grab them, as may be the case with you know, Appassionata or, or Tempest or so many other sonatas, which have possibly more direct impact on the listener. This is very, very complex. I used to be able to make all my other circumstances subservient to my art. 
I admit, however, that by doing so, I became a bit crazy. My servant has been quite different since I threw those books at her head. I still have to find a new housekeeper. She must be a good cook and ought to be able to turn her hand to mending shirts. The new kitchen maid made a really wry face about carrying wood. I trust that she will remember that even our redeemer had to drag his cross to Golgotha. I am not at all well. And for some time now, I have again had to take medicine. Hence, I can scarcely devote myself for a few hours a day to heaven's most precious gift to me, that is, my art. October 27th, 1819. I am to be recognized forthwith as Karl's sole guardian. Moreover, the mother is to be forbidden to associate with her son. August the 5th, 1820. I cherish the hope of being able perhaps to set foot next year on my native soil and to visit my parents' graves. Beethoven's hearing got worse. Custom-built ear horns got bigger. Pianos were made louder. At 49, he was completely deaf. Friends could communicate only by writing. He becomes more and more reclusive, cut off from the world by his increasing deafness and by his bitterness over the failure of his affairs with women and, in general, a darkening view of the world. He obviously became very, very disorganized and shabby. On one occasion, late in his life, he was even arrested because the Viennese police thought he was a tramp and took a lot of persuading that he was, in fact, the great Beethoven. Apparently, there were occasions when his friends would actually swap clothes that he'd discarded while he was sleeping and put new clothes in, in their place, which he'd then put on the next day without even noticing. If you were in luck, you could catch him in a very generous and expansive mood. After all, we know he liked his wine. He liked company. He loved being at the tavern, um, drinking and eating. And he may even made a note to himself once in his diary saying, you know, I really must make sure that every day I seek the company of a musician in order to find out more about how the violin works, how the oboe works, how the trombone works, and that way in company to learn more about, uh, about the instruments and about my uh, art and about life. He was not only humble in that respect, but he was warm-hearted and wanted to have contact with people. Therefore, if you rang his doorbell, of course he was immensely temperamental. You might catch it at the wrong time and get a, a bucket of water in your face. But also he might say, come in, my dear fellow, yes. Um, of course, I invent these words, this is clear. But one gets all the impressions from every, all the surviving documents, one of which is the most, uh, most amazing document that came to light in Cornwall, of all places, in 1999. And this was a hitherto unpublished, unknown, totally unknown, manuscript of a string quartet movement, um, which is, if I recall rightly, about 26 bars. It lasts under a minute, but is a beautifully crafted work in an unusual key, B minor, which it turned out he 
composed on the spot for an English visitor who called on him in Vienna in 1819. I mean, this is extraordinary. Another thing we have to bear in mind, I think, is the contrast between the, the outward uh, chaos of his daily life and the extraordinary control that he was able to exert over the details of his music. There's every truth in the, the kind of romantic Im image of Beethoven as a composer who expresses all sorts of emotions in his music, but he's also, in my view, an incredibly cerebral composer as well. Uh, the, the, the musical structures that he creates are extraordinarily complex. He's able to express or, 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 or to, to exert in his music the kind of control over detail that clearly escaped him in daily life altogether. Beethoven began composing what would be the last of his piano sonatas, Opus Works 110 and 111. You can see sometimes very obsessive elements in the way he writes. For instance, in the lamenting song, the, the Klagen der Gesang in, in Opus 110, when, it, when you have it for the second time in G minor, there's such specific indications that he writes. You know, even in, in those bars, there are so many examples of, of this, this obsession with, with detail. Um, when he's, he's, he writes that it has to sound exhausted, it's like you're, you're completely spent of, of energy. And the feeling of trying to catch your breath and the way he actually manages to, to convey that in his notation is, is amazing. Here you have these very short uh, phrases which in some sense could have been a, a, a longer line. He could have written it like this. So you just feel the continuity of that line. But instead, it's as if um, we don't even, we shouldn't even have enough breath in our lungs to carry through these relatively short phrases. So that feeling of exhaustion has to come across. It's very difficult to do. In many of the late pieces, it's like he is becoming more and more aware of the acoustic phenomena, and, and which is quite remarkable for somebody who, at this stage, was totally deaf. Um, there's a place in the Opus 110 Sonata, for example, which is just, it's just repeating um, this, this note again and again. repeating this, this note in the treble again and again and again and listening to it. There's one part of the variation that's um, in just in the lower bit of the piano and one that's in the highest bit um, up there. And this, there's this abyss in between that's remaining untouched. thing on the side we don't know if you really meant it but what happened here in the left hand is basically the theme of the ode to joy which he was hiding in there 
if he really meant that. It, it is the same time that he wrote this sonata. This piece symbolizes eternity. While I was dozing, I dreamt that I was traveling to very distant parts of the world, even to Syria and, in fact, to India and back again, and even to Arabia. And in the end, I even got as far as Jerusalem. However glittering his fame may seem on the surface, the artist is not allowed to be Jupiter's guest in Olympus every day. Vulgar humanity too often drags him down against his will from those pure ethereal heights. After more than four years in the writing and almost as much effort in trying to sell it to Europe's royal families, Beethoven revealed his proudest achievement, his mass, the Missa Solemnis. My chief aim when I was composing this mass was to awaken and permanently instill religious feeling into the listeners. Ist das längste äh, Werk von Beethoven abgesehen von, äh, von seiner Oper. Er wollte ein wichtiges Werk schreiben. Er wollte mit diesem Werk ein bisschen vielleicht sein, äh, sein Vermächtnis an die, an die nachfolgenden Generationen geben. Beethoven war kein praktizierender Katholik. Er hat sicher die Idee des Gottes in sich, aber er war kein äh, Ähm, eben, er war nicht so vertraut, er war jemand, der äh, darüber nachgedacht hat, der gesucht hat nach der Gottheit und nach dem katholischen Gott. very devoted to God, and there are a lot of little prayers in his private writings. And it slips out in a little court case with his nephew. His nephew's asked, does Beethoven ever pray with you? He says, yes, he prays with me twice a day to God. And we would never know this if it just hadn't happened to slip out in the court case. Every day, twice a day, Beethoven was praying to God. Ich glaube, das ist der Benediktus ist, ist in vielen Messen oder Requiem der zentrale Punkt, weil das ist die äh, Göttheit, die zu uns kommt. Und diese Benediktus von Beethoven kommt noch eine Überraschung hinzu. Das ist der Heilige Geist und der Heilige Geist als äh, Teil der Dreifaltigkeit kommt mit einer Violine zu uns. Wir kennen den Vater, wir kennen den Sohn. Mit dem Heiligen Geist können wir uns kaum etwas Konkretes vorstellen, weil es eben nicht konkret ist. Das ist etwas, was über alles schwebt. Und so ist die Violine in diese, äh, wie 
dieser Teil geschrieben ist, schwebt über alle, schwebt über Solisten, schwebt über Chor, schwebt über Orchester. Also ich habe für Beethoven zwei Bilder. Das sind ja richtige Bilder. Ein großes Gehirn und ein ebenso großes Herz. Diese zwei äh, Sachen kämpfen gegeneinander sehr oft. Aber sehr oft lieben sich auch. Es kommt so viel, so viel Liebe, so viel... Mitgefühl, so viel Leidensfähigkeit und das kommt alles aus dem Herzen. My income is practically nothing. My poor health has not allowed me to undertake professional tours or avail myself of all the means by which a livelihood is made. While writing the Missa Solemnis, Beethoven received an offer from London. I am delighted to accept this offer to write a new symphony for the Philharmonic Society. If God would only restore my health, then I could comply with all the offers from throughout Europe and even of North America. gets to this block of chords. There is a, an urgency, an anxiety in this uh, symphony, this uh, anxious energy. Symphony begins in despair. He's, he says, "This is our this, this is our despair." He writes in the margin of, the, of a sketch for the Ninth Symphony, um, and the second movement is no better. It's also terrifying. The, the hounds of hell are at your heels. The third movement is an image of something quite different: of love and beauty. When I conduct this movement, I always imagine Beethoven, 53 years old, probably not so energetic or not so powerful. Uh, from some uh, iconography, we, we now know Beethoven was not a big man, was not tall, <laughs> was a pretty small man. He probably was not uh, with this kind of uh, posture to be grand. It was a little bit more intimate, more... <laughs> more fragile, more weak. And just saying that, okay, I wrote this most sincere confession about the love of the life he could write in music. And you wonder how he's going to bring these things together and he finally does it in the in the last movement with a simple tune which he spent weeks polishing to make it simpler and simpler and simpler which is now the um, anthem of the European Union <laughs> 
is it what brings he brings hope and salvation to the despair of the first movements. I think one of the, the points of the Ninth Symphony is its monumentality, uh, plain and simple. Um, I don't think there had ever been a, a symphony, certainly, uh, so massive as the Ninth. And for that reason alone, it makes a profound impression. Very soon after that wonderful outburst, everything stops and you go, Zeit umschlungen me. You know, what is all this about? One sort of disjointed line with no harmony, just after a massively joyous outburst. And this can only be puzzling and detract from the immediacy of the entire work's ability to communicate immediately with people who don't know Beethoven at all. Um, so it's, the Ninth Symphony has got wonderful moments. Um, and some of the most universal moments in all Beethoven. But as a piece, it is, I hate to say flawed, because it's one of the most iconic, no, perhaps the most iconic piece of classical music there is. But I think it is flawed. Um, it is perhaps inevitable that it's flawed because it's so original, and that's why it's so great. <laughs> If the end of the Ninth Symphony is just, oh, happy end, we are all brothers, we love it, each other. I don't feel that in this music. From the, the, the very whisper in the shadow, this to this scream at the end of everybody, all the musicians, all the singers, 
sharing not this joy, but this espérance of joy, this dream of joy, this if only it could be like that. As the symphony ended, Beethoven, standing near the wings, was turned to face the audience and was amazed. After five ovations, two more than the emperor traditionally received, the police stepped in to silence the crowd. May 1825. Dear Dr. Braunhofer, I spit a good deal of blood. I have frequent nose bleedings. My stomach has become dreadfully weak. Dear Carl, to be constantly alone makes me only weaker. In any case, death with his scythe will not spare me much longer. Before my departure for the Elysian fields, I must leave behind me what the eternal spirit has infused into my soul and bids me complete. After all, only art and science gives us hopes of a higher life. His deafness at this stage perhaps even helped him creatively, loosened all possible barriers of convention, practicability, accessibility, so that he could just follow his imagination wherever it took him. The idea of this man was just uh, beyond the, 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 possible, the, the possibilities considered possible at that time. So it's uh, the, the imagination of Beethoven, probably because he was deaf. So he was disconnected in a way from the reality. Probably he went uh, much more deeply inside himself. He tried to listen very carefully to his inner, inner hearing, just, the, just to listen to the, the very specific, deep voice that was singing inside himself. I think the late quartets are, are amongst the most extraordinary creations of mankind. There's something in the emotion which has completely changed. And I, I don't know, I just have this personal feeling that there's some form of acceptance of life and just celebrating all aspects of life, including its pain and including its suffering, so that he was somehow able to accept that suffering as simply a part of life. But that suffering intensified. In August 1826, Karl, endlessly bullied by Beethoven, tried to kill himself. 
Such horror took its toll. Vienna, March the 6th, 1827. I cannot foresee the end of my dreadful illness. On the contrary, my sufferings and my anxieties have only increased. What am I to live on until I have recovered my lost strength and can again earn my living by means of my pen? Vienna, March the 10th, 1827. My health, which will not be restored for a very long time, demands that you should send me the wines I asked for. They will certainly bring me refreshment, invigoration, and good health. Forever the optimist, and planning new works, including a 10th symphony, but Beethoven's body had simply had enough. On the 26th of March, 1827, age 56, Beethoven died. Thousands turned out to pay their last respects. His repeated attempts to monumentalize, his repeated attempts to, you know, out to do, uh, all of his contemporaries were, were clearly eminently successful. Um, and so he became an intimidating figure. And in that sense, one part of Beethoven's legacy is uh, to push people away from him, to push people in directions uh, where they say, I can't do what Beethoven did, I'm not even going to try. See, you know, th that's the essential difference then, in a way, between Beethoven, Haydn, and Mozart. Beethoven could say, I'm going to do what Haydn and Mozart did, and just as well. Uh, but people uh, you know, in Beethoven's time didn't feel that they could compete. So that, that pushes uh, kind of the creative act or the compositional act for many composers away from the Beethovenian model. The uniqueness of Beethoven and the attempt of composers, writers, critics, listeners afterwards to come to grips with this uniqueness inevitably gave rise to a reevaluation of the past, the present, and future. 